Good afternoon. Um, today's video blog is about the prestige oil spill of November 2002 and the continuing litigation which has been working its way up through the courts of Spain and the courts, the English High Court. And matters are going to come to a crunch in December this year or possibly January of next year. The talk is entitled A Matter of National Prestige, Spain and France against a London P&I Club. And I must, um, at the beginning, declare an interest in case of any accusations of unconscious bias. I, um, I used to work in the London P&I Club. It was my, my first employment. So I may have some um, natural um, bias in favor of them and I shall do my best to keep that under check in um, this outline of the litigation. So, the prestige oil spill. November 2002 is when it happens. There's a spill of 50,000 metric tons of a cargo of 77,000 tons of heavy fuel oil. Not good news for a thousand miles of coastlines in Spain, France and Portugal. So the first step in the litigation is in a criminal case. There are criminal proceedings brought against the master, Captain Manguras, in Spain. And to these, um, as an action civile, were attached claims for civil damages which were being brought by Spain and France against three people. The ship owner, the p &I Club, the London p &I Club, and the um, the fund. That's the fund under the uh, CLC regime, the 1992 fund. Substantial sums have been claimed. Spain is claiming 4.3 billion euros and France a more, rather more modest 67.5 million euros. Now, these amounts are clearly way over the aggregate of the ship owners liability under the oil pollution convention, the 1992 CLC, and also then the second tier of compensation provided for by the fund. Uh, if you aggregate those two together, you should have an overall cap of 171 million euros. And what's been claimed is substantially in excess of that. The ship owner does its bit, it um, deposits the amount of 18.884 million SDRs with the criminal court um, in Corcubion in Spain back in 2003 to constitute its limitation fund under the 1992 CLC. In November 2013, the first instance criminal court finds in, in La Coruna finds that the master isn't criminally liable and no compensation is awarded to the claimants. Much celebration in the London PNI Club. However, the Spanish Supreme Court in January 2016 overturns that. As regards the master, he can't rely on Article 3, Rule 4 of the CLC, which is the channeling provision preventing claims being made outside the ship owner for pollution, because there's been willful default. And the ship owner is also vicariously liable for his willful default and liable in its own right. And the ship owner has lost their right to liability. Their, their willful default is by undertaking a last voyage for the vessel when it knew the ship was in a poor structural state and was going to encounter adverse weather conditions which the ship would not be in a position to withstand. Right, but what about the club? Now, before we get on to the club, one point I ought to mention is that what was going to be awarded, and that was subsequently going to be quantified um, uh, by, by the first instance court, 
were substantial sums for environmental damage and for moral damage. Headings of damage which um, don't exist under the CLC, they're not compensable um, heads of pollution damage. What is environmental damage? Well, we get a little teasing um, sentence from the Supreme Court of um, Spain. The non-material damages caused are obvious, extensive and profound, not only because of the sense of fear, anger and frustration which affected many of the Spanish and French citizens, but also the indelible mark of the perception that disasters of this or even greater magnitude can at any times affect the victims themselves. So it's our old friend hurt feelings, I think, really there. But um, sorry, I think I just left part of my um, unconscious bias coming out there. You're not going to get that under the CLC. You wouldn't get that type of damages uh, in, a, in, a, in a claim in, um, in England. But that's what's been awarded. But, you know, it can't. It, there's a cap on it, it can't be more than 30% of the overall um, real damages which have been awarded. Now, you know, one argument about this is, I mean, what about the fact that you can only get pollution damage when you're under the CLC? Uh, Article 3.4, ship owners shall be liable for pollution damage and no claim for compensation for pollution damage shall be made other than under the convention. So I suppose Spain could say, well, that prevents us making a claim other than under the convention for pollution damage, but this is something which isn't pollution damage because um, uh, it's clearly stated elsewhere in the, in the convention as, as to what constitutes pollution damage and pure environmental damage and moral damages are not pollution damage under the CLC. So I suppose they've got a, a, a case there, although um, I have a little bit of doubts about how, how strong that is. What about the London Club? They were held liable up to the limit of the ship owner's cover per pollution incident. So that's one billion. They are being held liable through a direct action statute against liability insurers, which exists under Spanish law. And the effect of that um, direct action statute is that effectively they become subrogated to the rights of the insured. And that means they're going to have to take the insurance contract warts and all something which I will come back to in a moment, which is quite significant. Well, I suppose this is better than being liable for over 4.7 4 billion euros, which is the original claim, but um, I think the club are perhaps a little bit displeased to having to have this excessive liability. You would have thought this is an oil pollution incident. Um, you know, we, we pick up the first, our, our ship owner's sh um, figure, and then um, the fund pick up the, the next tier, and then that's it. Not so. Now, there's a provision, Article 7 8 of the CLC provides that the liability insurer may rely on the ship owner's limits of liability, even if the ship owner is not entitled to rely on them, and may avail himself of the defense that the pollution damage resulted from the willful misconduct of the owner. Well, you would have thought that that gives them a cast iron defense to sort of under the direct action statute of having to pay out anything in relation to the excess um, over the ship owner's limits of liability because the ship owner has um, lost the right to rely on those limits because of its willful default. Very difficult to find out how the Spanish Supreme Court deal with this, but there's a sort of oblique reference by saying that 
well, it's all the fault of the club for deciding not to enter an appearance in the Spanish proceedings. And if they'd have entered an appearance, they could have raised this um, defence there. If they'd have entered an appearance, they could also have been taken to have submitted to the jurisdiction of the, um, the Spanish court. And um, then if things had gone against them, there would have been absolutely um, no way of subsequently challenging that adverse judgment. So, London PNI Club take no part in the initial proceedings. They do not submit to the jurisdiction. They live to fight another day. And what they do is they think, right, we, you, you're suing us in Spain in, in these criminal proceedings under your direct action um, statute and under this direct action statute really you're going to be put being put in the place of uh, insured and you've got to take the into account the rules of the club and one of the rules is if you, you know you, you must arbitrate and also what about the pay to be paid provision in the club rules the before we hand over any compensation to the ship owner under the policy, he's got to have discharged the liability himself. So what they do is they get an arbitration underway. Spain and France take no part in it, so there's a sole arbitrator, Mr. Schaff, and he arbitrates and he gives a declaration in his award that Spain and France are bound by the arbitration clause in the club rules that they must refer the civil claims being brought in Spain to arbitration. And furthermore, actual payment of the insured liability by the insured member, the ship owner, is a condition precedent to the club's liability pursuant to the pay to be paid clause. In the absence of any such prior payment, the club isn't liable to France or Spain in respect of the claims. And in any event, the club's liability isn't to exceed US dollars 1 billion, which is the total amount for any one incident for um, pollution cover. Quite a useful little arbitration award because it can then be converted into a high court judgment. And that's what happens in the two cases I've got up here. First, the first one is the um, decision of Mr. Justice Hamblin in 2013, and then it's confirmed in 2014 by the Court of Appeal. We, sorry, unconscious bias against, again, the London PNI Club now has a judgment, a judgment in an EU member state. The final judgment in the Spanish proceedings comes, well, in fact, the, the, the first the, the first instance decision comes after this, and the final decision comes quite a few years after it. The club has got its judgment in first, and that's going to be significant. Because the club feel that now we've got the first judgment on the question of our liability um, under the direct liability statute um, on which Spain is trying to proceed against us. That should make any subsequent judgment in the Spanish proceedings unenforceable in England. Article 34.3 of the Brussels 1 regulation of 2001 says a judgment will not be recognized in a member state if it is irreconcilable with a judgment given in a dis dispute between the same parties, club, Spain, France, in the member state in which recognition is sought. So that ought to dispose of the matter, but will it? Well, Spain has now obtained an order in England, registering its judgment to enable it to enforce in England. 
and the club have appealed, principally on the ground of Article 34.3, that the judgment is irreconcilable with the previous decisions of the English courts, which converted Mr. Schaff's declaratory arbitration award into a judgment. They're also um, appealing on the grounds that the recognition is manifestly contrary to public policy in the member state in which recognition is sought. And I have some sympathy with that ground. And in a case management conference at the beginning of this year, Mr. Justice Tier ordered that the trial be scheduled for after the 1st of December 2020, and it's estimated it's going to last five to six days. So whether it actually happens at the end of this year or at the beginning of next year is, is unclear, but it's going to be happening soon. And in the meantime, there have been some interesting preliminary moves, a bit of shadow boxing in advance of the decision. First of all, the club goes to the court to get permission to reconvene the arbitration, to ask the tribunal to grant an anti-suit injunction against Spain, alternatively, or in addition, damages for breach of the duty to arbitrate and or abide by the previous award, which would cover such things as its costs in its previous section 66 proceedings, which led to the conversion of the award into judgment. Um, there's no question of sovereign immunity. Mr. Justice Henshaw decides that section three of the relevant act says, well, this is taking part in commercial activities and you haven't got any immunity as a state if you do that. And so Spain can be proceeded against. And it is arguable that these remedies which the club is seeking would be available in the arbitration. So they get the permission to reconvene the arbitration. The club are also uh, making a claim in damages against Spain and France for continuing the proceedings in Spain. And this is based either on breach of the arbitration agreement itself, alternatively on a failure to act in accordance with the section 66 judgments, which were given in 2013 in the High Court and then affirmed in 2014 by the Court of Appeal. The, the judgments which by which the arbitration award was converted into a high court judgment. So the club needs to serve proceedings out of the jurisdiction of the French and Spanish states. Not surprisingly, they resist saying, oh, sovereign immunity. And in any case, there's no jurisdiction. Well, not surprisingly, um, the sovereign immunity arguments are dismissed. But what about permission to serve France and Spain out of the jurisdiction? Now, this is not given as regards the claim based on the Section 66 judgments. The Brussels 1 recast regulation in Section 3 has a whole section about um, jurisdiction and insurance matters. And looking at Article 14.1, it is clear that France and Spain needed to be sued in their domicile in France and Spain. So no question of suing them out of the jurisdiction to get them sued in England. What about the arbitration award? It's a separate claim. Well, this is within the arbitration exception, which is present in the Brussels 1 regime. So it's a question about um, our common law rules for service out of the jurisdiction under the uh, civil procedure rules. And it's clearly within either the arbitration or the contract governed by English law gateways under that um, practice division, so practice direction. Is there, any, is there a serious issue to be tried as to liability and damages? 
Now, the governments themselves were not directly party to the agreements, and the awards had been technically merely declaratory of the club's rights. But nonetheless, there's still an argument, a serious issue, as to whether if you ignore the um, declaratory award, whether you might be liable in damages. And so, leave to serve out has been given as regards the damages claim for failing to um, abide by the arbitration award, um, the declaratory award by Mr. Shutt. So what that means is you sue us, if you win, we're gonna get back, we want to get those damages back from you for breaching um, your obligations in relation to the arbitration award. Finally, I'm just going to go back to the appeal against the registration order. What, how is Spain resisting this? We get some indication of this in uh, Mr. Justice Tears' judgment, which is primarily to do with case management and it's, um, it's to do with various bits of evidence and um, documents which are being the club are requiring or asking for Spain to um, disclose. But this is the main basis of Spain's challenge against um, the club's appeal. The question is, are the English judgments not qualifying judgments because they conflict with section three of chapter two of the Brussels one regulation? In particular, is the respondent Spain entitled to rely on the exclusive rules of jurisdiction in section three of chapter two? And in particular, yeah. Is it entitled to rely on the protective rules in section three? There is a serious doubt as to whether this type of argument has any um, relevance to the question of enforcement of judgments and the operation of article 34.3. It's something which clearly was highly relevant when you were getting um, the application to serve out of the jurisdiction in relation to your claim for damages for breach for failing to honor the the section 66 judgments but i i think it's without trying to prejudge anything i think it, it, it's this is um, a less strong argument when it comes to um article 34. This, we've got two judgments. They cover the same parties and essentially the same issue. One's in England, one's in Spain, the English one's first. Um, there's nothing which I found in the Brussels regulation which says you then have to go digging around to see whether that first English judgment um, was wrong because it conflicted with section three. I don't think it did conflict with section three because it was a judgment which was giving effect to an arbitration award. Arbitration is outside the Brussels regulation anyway. What do I know about this? We shall see where things lie um, either shortly before Christmas or shortly after. So thank you for your um, attention. There will be another video blog coming out very shortly and that will be on the question of implied liabilities for demurrage on the part of parties to the bill of lading thank you for your attention and um, goodbye for now